Hello, I'm Kirsten Piper Brown, operatic soprano, and I have the great pleasure of helping our martial opera friends get to know Mark Shapiro a little bit better. Now, okay. <laughs> hello, <laughs> I'm going to talk about you just a little bit. Now, Mark can conduct anybody and any instrument and make them sound absolutely gorgeous. So if you ever hear of him conducting a new cantata for cats, don't walk, run to get your ticket because it's going to be fabulous. Bar lines are none. There could be a change of meter or keys in the middle of the bar and Mark will hold the ensemble together. I know this. Equally at home, leading orchestras, choirs, and operas from whichever time period, Mark has a tidy shelf of six ASCAP awards. How many North American conductors have that many? And uh, was music director of the Prince William Island, um, sorry, the Prince Edward Island Symphony and the first and only American to hold this position. Marcus uh, was recently honored with the title of Conductor Emeritus. He is the Artistic Director of Cantori New York and the Cecilia Chorus of New York and conducts operas all over with superb pacing and great confidence, says Opera News all over the world. Congratulations on your new appointment as Principal Conductor of Martial Opera, Mark. Thank you, Kirsten. <laughs> All right, so let's dig in because um, I'd love um, to hear all of your uh, deepest, darkest secrets. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to go that deep. Uh, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about you and um, and about the company. But first, let's talk about maybe a little bit about music in your childhood. Tell me where you grew up. Sure. So I grew up in Englewood, New Jersey, uh, same hometown as John Travolta. Oh, cool. <laughs> Yes, I believe oh, that's true. That. <laughs> <laughs> and the resemblances don't stop, as you can see. So um, <laughs> um, I think the in terms of musical background, probably the deepest roots would be my father's father, who was an Orthodox cantor um, oh. in, in synagogues. He was both a rabbi and a cantor. This making sense. And um, <laughs> I barely knew him. He died when I was only uh, maybe four years old. But um, he oh. left behind some uh, recordings of himself singing, mm -hmm. uh, some Jewish liturgy that I posted to SoundCloud. Mm -hmm. And of course, my father who was uh, also no longer living. My father knew these tunes really well. So there was a real line of transmission of that music through oh. the family. And now at a lot of, you know, satyrs and things like that, it's me that is the kind of bearer of these tunes. Of course. Um, we all sing them together. So there's, a, I think that's a big part of my musical roots. Um, then because we were so close to New York and I'm of that uh, generation, I saw a lot of the Leonard Bernstein's young person's concerts. Mm -hmm. um, we came to see them. And I think that was as for so many that they were very influential. And a lot of what um, happened in those concerts was really um, unforgettable. And I'll say one more. I remember we used to go, there was a symphony in Teaneck, New Jersey. Uh -huh. And um, I, I look back and think, you know, how good of my parents to support that symphony. But uh, they took us to concerts of the Teaneck Symphony. And I remember also enjoying those very much. Were you a little kid, like, waving your hands? So I was. Um, <laughs> I don't know where it came from. I think, you know, a lot of, of us kind of want to do this from a very early age. But mm -hmm. I do remember in kindergarten uh, at Show and Tell, I brought in a LP of Nutcracker and a chopstick. And oh, my gosh, that's so cute. <laughs> that's adorable. And uh, there was another student who I think her name was Elaine. She had cymbals. Um, and I was thinking, you know, how fun it would be to cue Elaine playing the cymbals. Oh, oh my gosh, this is so yeah. cute. <laughs> so there's some backstory for you. That's a lovely backstory. Wow. Fantastic. Uh, uh, I can tell you more. We had a piano teacher. My sister and I both had the same piano teacher. My sister was older. Um, and I had an earlier bedtime and I used to like listening to her practice. Oh. Um, so she played the Turkish Rondo of Mozart. I particularly remember that. Okay. Then when I got a bit older, we played four hands together. And mm -hmm. our piano teacher was was quite an interesting person. Um, I looked her up actually during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I sort of had the idea, 
And I discovered she had really played, she had had quite a career, you know, in the 1930s, mm. um, where she played concertos with Chicago Symphony. Thing. I had no idea. Amazing. Um, yeah, when, you know, we knew her much later in life. Uh -huh. um, and she was, it's probably fair to say she was a bit eccentric by then. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, she was certainly an interesting, very musical person, I think. Oh, wow. What yeah. a rich background. I, I'm imagining you falling asleep to the Turkish Wando and you know, just like, I'll, I'll try, you know, putting my kids to, to bed with that, seeing if they See end up work. wonder, right? <laughs> no, no. Yeah. So fast forward, I'll, I'll probably I might go a little bit back and forth and, you know, sure. just have fun here. Do you have a favorite piece that you've conducted by a living composer or a favorite piece you've conducted by perhaps a, a little known composer, a little known work? Um, that's a tough question. I think oh. I'll stick with the little known because if I say this piece by a living composer, all the other living composers will yeah, think- Yeah, they're gonna call you, they're gonna be in your yeah. DMs, yeah. They'll think I don't <laughs> love them and I love them all. Of course, so, of course. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's really true. I do, I'm sure you're the same way, but we mm -hmm. kind of fall in love with whatever we're doing. Yeah. We get totally wrapped up in it. You and I did a, have done several things together. And I think we both really were absorbed in those projects when we were doing them mm -hmm. and they couldn't have been more different. Right. So, yeah. Um, but I would say one composer that is very dear to my heart, who is not so well known is the Swiss composer, Frank Martin. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, with Cantori New York, we made the first CD recording of his, uh, he has a kind of chamber oratorio which is almost an opera called Le Vin Herbe. It's the Tristan and Isolde story um, for mm -hmm. chorus and soloist, seven strings and piano. That is a really special wow. piece. Yeah. And very, very dear to my heart. And all his music is very beautiful and very well made. Um, and I think because he's Swiss, um, you know, he didn't come from one of the big famous countries where we think of composers coming from. So he doesn't have as much of a kind of natural constituency as he could. So he would be one, I think, that among many possible answers to that question. Good one. And, it, and it's nice that you can attach that memory of that piece that you did. And I'm sure you are very proud of and proud of your ensemble. So I think that's where we kind of get our, our favorites from that experience. Yeah. Right? So speaking of experience, you, you kind of talked a little bit about a project we did together. Of course, we met, uh, I guess it was last year, um, yep. when you led our wonderful cast in music by Syrian Polish composer Zai Jabri. I remember coaching a few uh, sections uh, of, of the opera with you, and you stopped me <laughs> and looked. You put your baton and you looked at me rather inquisitively and asked if I ever thought about becoming a conductor, which right. made me like giggle. <laughs> <laughs> like, I had to call my mom about that. I'd pick up the phone and call her later. And what did she oh, say? I fooled him, mom. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, and then in, in another thing you asked me also, you know, as I'm singing this very, you know, we're doing this world premiere, you asked me if I, if I sang Bach. Uh, which was also interesting to me at the time, uh, as we were about, you know, more than 300 years ahead. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. But it made me think of the common threads in classical music, all across classical music. Um, and I, and, and even as we were working on the Bach, you asked me to sing it the way I would sing any other piece of music. Tell me about your approach to different periods of music. Do you make adjustments in conducting um, and why or why not between periods? Do, would you have conducted the uh, Jabri the same way you conduct Bach? Tell me a little bit about how, because you seem to be able to conduct anything. <laughs> Thank you. I, I love that question, actually. So mm -hmm. I think in all my life, in so many ways, I have really run away from being a specialist. Um, I have never wanted to be in any kind of box or file cabinet. Yep. Um, so I think the answer to your question about conducting things similarly mm -hmm. in a very particular way has to be yes. Yeah. Because in the same way, I think, let's say, an actor would think about playing a Shakespeare character or somebody in a contemporary play 
you're trying to think yourself into the piece that you're doing, into the text, and to think yourself into the spirit of the time. And then with music, I think so much music, even though it has, the language has evolved as has English since Shakespeare over time, I'm much more interested in the commonalities. So I remember a Bach project where there was a lot of talk about kind of um, style and special things. And at one point I sort of said, well, this is a funeral cantata. And I think if we think about going to a funeral, we already, we have done that. And we have some information that we can bring to the performance that is really powerful just from our own lives and from being human beings with, with experience. So I think we, something I always try to do as a conductor is really listen, listen to the piece, listen to the performers mm -hmm. um, and listen. It's a particularly kind of in the moment listening to what is happening in the room today. Um, and what do I think are the possibilities today? So I think we get we get so I see it a lot in my students. People are so focused on, well, how will the video be? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that this art form didn't really emerge that way. And I think if you're making a video recording, that's your project. Mm -hmm. But we really want to be living in the moment as performers on in the live arts. Mm -hmm. And you stay open to hearing some possibility, some relationship among the, the notes something in the sound world as it unfolds. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a kind of longish answer to the question of, yes, I think there is a unity of approach, mm -hmm. which is a certain kind of listening. Mm -hmm. And that's so, so wonderful. And, and I, I'll say as a performer and as one who, who folks have tried to put into a box, I appreciate you hearing my voice and hearing it outside of the piece and, and having an imagination <laughs> that some people just don't have and saying, oh, and, and just really loving the voice and, and encouraging me to sing with my voice. And so I, I hope that all conductors can do that and give that advice to singers. So I really appreciate the freedom that you've allowed me, um, but that, that's wonderful. Absolutely. What, yeah. What advice would you give someone you also uh, are a wonderful educator, and I'm sure you're in contact with uh, and, and mentor and teach many, many students. But what advice would you have given um, yourself early in your career? If you if you could look at yourself now, you know, and, and see yourself and say, hey, little Mark, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> what advice would you give, I'd say, you know, your student self? So that's a excellent question i wanted to i will answer i wanted to go back just to one thing we were talking about before and say i hope it's going to be one of the values of martial opera that we are really going to focus on listening to the music in that way so we aren't kind of you know superimposing any any ideas on it yeah. um but really listening to what these composers who i think were working very much in that tradition and in that vein mm -hmm. what they are saying um, so I wanted to just stick that in there, but, um, coming back to your question, um, certainly I would say play the piano. Mm. So I think you play the piano, right? <sighs> uh, <laughs> yeah. um, I can tell my younger self to play that piano. <laughs> yeah. It's really comes in handy. And I think, um, to, to, and, and to understand why you're playing it, to play it for certain reasons, mm. um, I use it a lot to coach. I'm not as fluent as a pianist as many, but, you know, to sort of understand how how it can support that kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, but I think uh, the bigger question, um, and I think it certainly informs my teaching now, is it's really, it piggybacks onto what we were just talking about, that it's it's about, all conducting is really about understanding the music mm -hmm. and about how you hear the music um, you know, I think is something I think you would relate to when you create a role, mm -hmm. there's a kind of listening to the character that you do. You don't just come in immediately with your idea of the character. 
I think the character kind of, you spend time with the text mm -hmm. and the character starts to just kind of build in you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the things we really want to do as performers is listen to those inner impulses mm -hmm. about this is the piece telling you, this is what I am. Mm -hmm. This is who I am. So I think in, in conducting increasingly, a lot of people think very much about the mechanics and the appearance. And I think both of those are completely um, false idols. Mm -hmm. And it's really about, those things are completely secondary to really understanding the processes if the composer is thinking that way. So, and think you get, it's one of the wonderful things about teaching. I was teaching Sibelius Third Symphony mm -hmm. um, last fall, which is a piece I really love. And you, there's something you kind of, there's a, there's a sort of isolated contrabass lick. Mm -hmm. um, and I had never kind of thought about, gee, why, why, what, what is that? And then as I was observing the student, my ear just said, well, that's really what's gluing the piece together. Mm -hmm. That's, that's really what's driving. And when you start to see how the mosaic fits together, um, I think that's what conducting is really meant to be about. So for my young self, I would say I would have wanted to really and as I try to do as a teacher, really inspire people and myself to trust that you can figure it out. You will learn it. You don't have to have somebody else tell you, you have to do it, but you do have to understand what you're trying to do. So you really have to understand how to study a score, how to think about the elements of a score, the harmony, the counterpoint, the instrumentation, but not in a kind of um, coldly, harshly academic way. But something that is much more organic and integrated. Absolutely, I, I and I, I feel the same way. I, I, I say the same thing to young singers. Is you know you have notes on a page, and sure you can sing beautifully, but what does your soul have to? What does your soul say about what you're singing, and what are you communicating? And I think uh, you know conductors have a lot of communicating to do, not just with you know with their ensemble, but the audience and and I've I've heard from <laughs> audience members how much they enjoy your conducting. <laughs> like you. I, I had a cousin who came to Carnegie Hall and she says she couldn't take her eyes off you because <laughs> you're just so into it. And, and even though she had never, you know, sat in Carnegie Hall or listened to Bach ever, she was just so enraptured. And so it's an important job that you have that that you are. Because she barely listened to me. So thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, she she missed something beautiful then. But, uh, oh no, no! But yeah. you do such a great job, and it's great that you are teaching, um, you know, young young conductors that you know it's 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 so much more to it than the academics. Well, if you teach, you you know that you learn so much by teaching. Exactly, which is why so, selfishly I teach. It's a very selfish, selfish <laughs> it is. pleasure. Yeah, I, it's I've wonderful so to much. see those light bulbs come up with your yeah. students and, and even with your your you know musicians that you're working with. Absolutely, um, and you know the other aspect of conducting is there's there, it's so subtle to learn how to communicate with so many people in so many different ways all at the same time. Wow. So it's a lot of figuring out really what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. and to to try to get away from a lot of nonsense about how you should appear and mm -hmm. that is just not what it's about so it's mm -hmm. you know it's even just an intuition for glancing at a particular player or singer x number of microseconds before they do something and all of those intuitions i think are are intuitive mm -hmm. so to to be able to really locate them yeah yeah. And then uh, I'll say one more thing, but and then for again, for the opera company in particular, it's really about love of the singing voice. Mm. So and the sound of the voice. Um, I think that's something I have always loved. Mm -hmm. um, my parents did listen to opera on the record player. Mm -hmm. um, they listened a lot to Puccini and, you know, that was around. Um and to folk music. So there was a lot of Pete Seeger and John 
and Baez and people like that. Um, and also jazz singers, Sarah Bond was a family favorite. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the, a value that I really want to bring to martial opera in my role there is front and center, the singing voice. Mm -hmm. That a singer, any singer who sings with us feels like they can really sing. Love that. Yeah. So speaking of martial opera audiences, mm -hmm. what would you say, because I hear this, I hear, oh, I don't like new opera, or what would you say to someone who says that they don't want to go to an opera to hear new music? What, what, what would you say to them or what would you, what advice would you offer them to, to come in and, and try listening and experiencing a new work? So I, again, I think that's a good question and not a not a simple one because nope. you know new can mean many things to many people. Yeah. So, and you know, I think you and I probably have both participated in pieces that we wouldn't necessarily want to hear. Mm -hmm. So, that's a that's a tricky question. But I think one of the things that I try to do as a programmer mm -hmm. and. Um, so I'm not the artistic director of martial opera, that's Jim Schaefer. Um, but I think we're aligned in wanting to program pieces that we believe in. Mm -hmm. And for me, as I said earlier, that allow for beautiful singing. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, people will say beauty is in the eye of the beholder and beauty, who knows what beauty means. Um, but I think a lot of us nonetheless have a sense of, wow, that's a beautiful voice. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to hear it do its thing. Mm -hmm. So for me, that immediately means the vocal writing has to be very grateful. Mm -hmm. um, again, I don't know, but I would imagine you have occasionally done pieces where the vocal writing is not ideal. True. <laughs> and... <laughs> um, to the extent that we can, I'm hoping in martial opera that the the experience of listening to the music mm -hmm. will be pleasurable. Mm -hmm. Even if the, let's say the harmonic idiom is, is less familiar, mm -hmm. that there will be something about the, the musical values that people who are responsive to musical values will really respond to. Mm -hmm. Why do you think now is the time for martial opera? Why martial opera and why now? It's a great question. Um, I think that the that Richard Marshall has really, who was so um, such a significant figure in contemporary opera in New York City for so long, um, I think has been understandably thinking very much about his legacy and the kind of values that he had and wanted to put into place. Um, and I think just the right group of people came together at the right time um, to want to do this with Jim, where he is in his uh, process and uh, Richard uh, Marshall, where he is and Jim Schaefer, um, I think he would probably admit he had sort of retired from another company and was feeling like, I'm, I don't think I'm done. So I think uh, he really wanted to bring his own um, ability and imagination to a new project. And then uh, the three of us had worked together in various contexts over the years. And I think we felt that this was a, a good fit all around. And what are you most looking forward to in the early days of martial opera? What are you most excited about? So I think the the early days of the company are going to be a, a lot about <clears throat> discovery. Hmm. Um, I don't think the, the immediate focus is actually going to be on producing operas. Hmm. I think it's going to be projects like this one where um, there's this project is part of an oral history series of a lot of interviewing of composers and just really um, finding singers, finding composers. And I think part of the, the idea that is really good is I think when there is a 
good singer composer chemistry i think that is going to lead to interesting places oh, yeah. so i think the early days of martial opera are going to be about discovery of what already exists so th the company's mission i think will ultimately ultimately include new opera mm -hmm. but i think it's also a, a very key part of the mission to present operas that exist and from the mid 20th century and even before or just after um, where there was so much great writing and so much of it is really um, just not talked about anymore. And there are a lot of really good pieces. So I think getting to know them, even um, as we've been talking about putting concert performances together of you know recital kind of things, so many discoveries of, you know, there's a lot of operas out there. So yeah. that's exciting. Well, I'm excited for you all, and I can't wait to <laughs> to see what you all uh, do in, in this opera world where, you know, I, I say that all the time, that we, we, we hear about all these pieces and we think they're new, but no, they're, they're not. They were just kind of forgotten. Yeah. And so I think it's wonderful that you all are going to be very intentional about um, showcasing those lesser, lesser known works. And I want to ask you also, you know, are you also uh, upset that you didn't bet that Jim Schaefer wasn't actually going to retire? I should have bet money on <laughs> it. You know, I would be rich right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Jim, you're you're not done. Come on, seriously. Yeah, yeah you're not. I think uh, he thought he should, and then he, it was clear to him. Nope, that's the wrong. No, one. no, right. <laughs> um, so I just have a, a, no, go ahead. Yeah, to say to actually, I think these two points are related. Mm -hmm. um, the, of Jim getting back into harness and also the repertoire that we're interested in. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a value that will be a core value for the company of not wasting or discarding talent. Um, mm -hmm. And in our world, which I think that it, it's complicated in opera, and I think in the, you know, what do you do with the past when you want to create a present? Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's also something, let's call it environmental, ecological, where all these things are there. Mm -hmm. You don't want them to uh, stifle you, but you also don't want to waste them. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm, that's been, a, I think that was a big family belief, actually, from particularly my father of not not wasting things you know people who grew up in depression era um you know my parents had the same toaster for 30 years so um i think in that value of saying that martial opera is aware that there are a lot of wonderful operas that exist um that shouldn't be wasted mm. but that should be should be valued and used um even while I think we would be very supportive of all the new things that are being written. Um, and then in a lighter vein on the spirit of Jim Schaefer, his uh, ability and energy should also not be wasted. <laughs> so he's back to work. He is, he's not wasting any of his energy sitting around doing no, nothing. Well, not um, and you're gonna be quite busy too. You're not gonna be wasting any of your energy either. <laughs> no, I. <laughs> Uh, there was a um, an English poet named Stephen Spender, um, and some uh, missionaries knocked on his door and said, are you saved? And he said, I don't want to be saved. I want to be spent. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> That's how I feel. I want to be, use me. Yeah, I love I mean, yeah. come on, what's the point of living, you know? Right. I love that. So just want to ask you a few questions, then I'll let you kind of, you know, round out whatever you'd like to say. Just a, a couple of questions, just so folks can get to know you. Kind of quick fire round. I'll, I'll say like this or that. You just pick pick the first one. Okay. So is sweet or spicy? That would have to be both. <laughs> you can't say both. <laughs> you have to pick one. Isn't there cooking that's like, I'm thinking of <laughs> spice, 
Thai food, you know, sweet and spicy, but probably spicy. <laughs> okay, spicy. Yeah. Here's a hard one. I'll put you on the spot. Bach or Handel? That is a hard one. Yeah, I did. Uh, you know, it's going to be both all the way down for me. Oh, gosh. Okay. I will, I think okay, Handel... here's a good, here's one. Okay. Mountain resort or beach? Beach. Okay, chocolate. Well, but not, not, not beach like lying around. So, you are too much. I want to be walking on a beach where oh. nobody nobody else is there. You may walk on the beach. Thank you. Okay. Chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. Okay. Oh, that's going to make a decision, are we? And that's last it. one here, winter or summer? You didn't ask about spring and fall. <laughs> oh, come on, guy. <laughs> Where'd you go to Yale or something? I, I did, yeah. Um, <laughs> Probably summer. Yeah, that's okay. I'm a Libra, so I totally get it. You, right, that's why we get along, right? Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to share um, about you know yourself with martial opera? Um, I think we covered a lot. So you know, I want to say thank you for um, those of us who are starting the company and starting this oral history. Um, we got to choose who we wanted to be interviewed by. And I thought of you right away. And I'm just so honored that you said yes. <laughs> yeah, of course. I wanted to make you nervous, though. Did you sweat? No? <laughs> oh, copiously. Yeah. <laughs> well, I also know, that they, our viewers will not know, that you you have a background both in, in musicology and radio. Yes. So I know yes, that. I because... can't decide what I want to do either. I can't pick this or that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why conducting, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, you never know. You never know. Yeah, I can totally yeah, scoot over. No, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I think it's going to be a very exciting project, and I'm I'm very interested to see the composers who will be part of this uh, oral history project. And I think we're going to make a lot of discoveries um, about the music, and there, there's really something that's going to come together. And I'm just thrilled to be on this journey. Well, thank you so much for asking me to chat with you. I'm sure our martial opera audiences will be. Just thrilled to hear a little bit about you and know that you love chocolate and uh, can't decide between Bach and Handel and all the other wonderful things we spoke about. So thank you so I'll much. I'll say one thing about Bach and Handel. First of all, I think Bach could have written opera had he had the opportunity. Absolutely. And somebody asked him because I think the music is often very theatrical in that way. Having said that, Handel, amazing how things he had a feel for the theater. That's so, true. Yeah. Yeah. Good drama. All the drama. All the drama. Um, on that note, thank you, Mark. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you, Kirsten. I appreciate okay. it. Mm -hmm.